Hey, everybody. Welcome to Next Level Healing. I am so excited here to be with Mark Gober. Uh, he has written six books. Uh, I've read all of them. His latest book, An End to Upside Down Medicine, uh, really is a paradigm shift. All of his books are paradigm shifts. Uh, Mark is a summa cum laude graduate from Princeton. He was uh, captain of the varsity tennis team, went to work on Wall Street, was successful at everything that he did. Uh, but he wasn't happy at the time because he was a materialist. And then he got curious about podcasts having to do with spiritual subjects. And after having heavily uh, gotten into that, he realized that the science behind all of uh, what he was listening to was tremendous. Um, and there were p-values out uh, to a uh, billion to one and beyond that this could be anything other than um, the paradigm that he was now looking at. Um, and uh, so he dove into this and has sort of been guided to write these books, which I'll let him all explain. Uh, but Mark, what has the journey been like? Um, what was it like going from, you have this wonderful description of the way you were before you made this transition, um, sort of being a um, I don't remember if you remember the exact line. I did have it memorized at one point, but you went from being this, you know, not happy, struggling uh, being to somebody that felt like a really important chess piece in a cosmic game. Do you remember that exact quote? Yes, I think that was my second book and End Upside Down Living. And I don't remember exactly what the quote is, but that was very close. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, tell us your journey. Uh, I, I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Um, I'd love to hear the reactions that you're getting to people because I've told so many people about you. In fact, I was sitting in the airport yesterday coming back from Cancun, a Joe Dispenza event, and there were two young Chinese men that were in the marketing area. And when I was telling them that, you know, you've proved that consciousness is lo not located in their brain, they were like, well, where is it then? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the next question they had is, is, is how, what does it mean for me? I mean, that was really, really their question. So um, these are profound questions and you have profound answers or at least uh, the questions to ask to to unravel those answers. So I'm just going to turn it over to you and be, give us a synopsis of what your journey has been like. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Tara, and thank you for having me on the show. The transformation and transition has been profound. That's the best way to put it. If I try to think back to the way I used to look at life, it's almost hard to put myself back in that mindset because it's so different. And yet at the same time, I'm the same person. I don't know how to explain that. I don't feel that different in many ways because the essence is still there. It was always there. But the way I approach life now is completely different. And what's so wonderful about you and your story is that looking from the outside, everybody would consider you like the pinnacle of success. You know, summa cum laude from Princeton, uh, captain of the varsity tennis team, went to work on Wall Street, did all these incredible things. Uh, give us a look inside what it felt like inside Mark Gober during that that realization and that transition. Well, I appreciate the kind words, but to me, it didn't feel like the pinnacle of success because there was always something that I hadn't achieved yet. And it was like starting from ground zero from a clean slate every time I had to get the next thing. So it was a treadmill. I was sprinting, but I wasn't really getting anywhere. And maybe there was a little bit of satisfaction because I had achieved certain things, but I was more focused on the things that I hadn't achieved. And there's still a piece of me that is like that, that hasn't gone away. So there's a perfectionistic aspect, and I, I try to channel that and hone it into different areas. Um, but it's part of it is the human experience, I think, the human condition. And you know this with the way our, our subconscious works and our, our thoughts and our beliefs, they get very entrenched. And I don't know the mechanism behind that, but there's something in our hard wiring that makes us very susceptible to that. And it takes effort really to question our thoughts and our beliefs and really to want to have the dedication and devotion and commitment to make things better. It, it doesn't happen on its own. Um, it, this has taken a lot of effort for me and it's still very much ongoing. But when I first started to dive in, I didn't have a near-death experience. I didn't have a big DMT trip or anything where I, the world opened up to me, it was much more gradual where I was actually learning things intellectually. And I was having synchronicities for sure, where there were strange occurrences happening around me, where there were coincidences that I couldn't understand that didn't seem like they were just chance. So those those sorts of occurrences helped, um, helped push me in the right direction. Because I do remember I would read a lot or I would have some experiences that were mystical. I worked with psychics and energy healers and that sort of thing very early on. This was about seven years ago. And those experiences had an impact on me. But then I would go back to work and I would go back into my old mindset. 
So it was like I was taking two steps forward, one step backward every time. Almost like a, if you look at the, the history of the S&P or something, it's a, the trend is upward, but it's up and down on the way there. That's the way this journey has gone. And it continues to be that way. And I, I would also add that it's just unexpected. Everything that's happened seems to like, every time I think I'm settled, then I'm unsettled all of a sudden. I mean, the topics I've written about were not on my radar at all. I started off talking about the nature of consciousness and the nature of reality, which maybe in some ways was on my mind, just generally speaking, because I had this view that life was meaningless. So I guess maybe part of me was asking those questions, but even that blew my paradigm open to learn new ways of thinking around that. And then I started looking at politics and medicine and the UFO phenomenon and Great Reset, all these things that were not, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have even said I was interested in those topics previously. So I, I wonder what's next. I'm in a place right now as we speak. My sixth book just came out recently and into Upside Down Medicine. I left my job four years ago after being in a great position. I was a partner and I decided I wanted to leave because I needed to give myself space to research. And I, I really do not know what is next. Uh, and that's an exciting place to be, isn't it? It's exciting and unsettling. I've been here before, so I'm used to it. Hey, guys. Studies are showing that 68% of people that watch podcasts regularly don't click the subscribe button. Do me a huge favor. If you like this content, click subscribe so other people know where to go for the cool stuff. Thank you. Well, it does seem that the 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 right thing shows up at the right time. Like they say that when the student is ready, the teacher arrives. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've sort of had a, an inspiration uh, at each turn. Uh, I'm just amazed at the depth and breadth of, of each of your books. I mean, uh, an end upside down medicine. I was sharing with people that I was sharing the book with that, I mean, there's 35 pages of endnotes and 35 pages of, of, of um, citations. So it's not like you just, you know, had a thought about something and figured you'd write it down and share it with people. You you really back it up with really great stuff. I mean, I, I'm familiar with a lot of the citations, but you, I, I, to me, you, ta you, you take a concept and, and just put a big red bow around it and make it so that a 10-year-old can understand it, which is delightful because these are very, very complex subjects. Um, and uh, I'm always fascinated by just uh, the the shifting of consciousness uh, on the planet. Uh, I, I'm anybody who knows me knows I do a lot of the Joe Dispenza work, and I'm very excited that he's quantifying. Um, Tony Robbins likes to say you can't manage what you don't measure, and uh, a lot of people are taking great pains to measure uh, these psychic phenomena, which really, you know, it's it's like when they thought the world was flat. You know, it was blasphemy to think otherwise. And when they thought that the sun went around the earth, it was blasphemy to think otherwise. And in much the same way, like you were talking about, that reptilian portion of the brain likes to believe that its version of reality is correct because otherwise its life is threatened. So people aren't so open-minded. We as a species are not so open-minded necessarily to looking at things from a different perspective. Is that what you're discovering along the way? Yes, there, there are psychological hurdles that I talk about in many of my books because I like to start with that because I, I know in the books I'm presenting things that are going to be hard for people because I know they were hard for me. And we have to loosen the psychological grip we have on whatever we think reality is. And you're reminding me of Byron Katie's work and her four questions. I mean, the first one is about any belief. Is it true? And then the second question is, can you absolutely know that that belief is true? And the answer for me every single time is no, except one belief, which is that at this moment, it feels like I'm having a conscious experience. That's the only thing I can say with certainty, that it feels that way right now. Everything else, including the past, is an inference because the past is just a, a thought I have in the present moment. And if you just really think about what I just said, apply it to every belief you have, you can't know with certainty. And then when I, I feel like life starts to change when the beliefs are held more loosely. I'm so glad you mentioned Byron Katie. She's one of my heroes. I have everybody reading her book. Um, one of the delightful things about that is people who are suffering and struggling, uh, when when they listen to her book, you know, she's working with all of these people who are intense in various forms of intense pain and suffering, uh, and in 20 minutes they're laughing and, and seeing it from a completely different perspective. And she's such a master at getting people to to shift and change. So, what was the when did the penny drop, or was it a series of penny drops that you know there you were working on Wall Street? Obviously, you're very stuck on the treadmill at the time. Because, you know, people don't go off into psychic phenomena when they're working on Wall Street. <laughs> um, wh how, what was the, uh, how did the uh, the crack first appear in the dam? 
Well, I think career-wise, I knew very early on, I was working in 2008 during the financial crisis in New York, that it wasn't for me. And I went into it because I thought it would be a good platform for my career. I didn't necessarily know if I wanted to be a career investment banker. So I started there and I, I knew this was just, it didn't feel like the right fit, but I, I stuck it out. And then I left to join another firm, first in Boston, and then the majority of my time was in Silicon Valley. And that was when I started to have my shift uh, during my time in Silicon Valley. And I felt like my life was hitting a wall in every area in my personal life, professional life. There were just so many things that were not going the way that I wanted, even though someone looking from the outside would have said, you're in great shape. I didn't feel that way. And then I also didn't feel like I had a sense of purpose because I thought life was meaningless. That was my cosmology. The first crack that I can think of, I mean, maybe when I was younger, there were instances I can look back in hindsight, but really the, the first tangible one was in August of 2016 when I was in this very low place, but listening to podcasts and just trying to learn new things. And I heard a woman, her name's Laura Powers. She's now a friend of mine, but she's a psychic. She was on Extreme Health Radio, which is a really interesting uh, alternative health show. And they not they're they're usually looking at health not from the spiritual perspective i mean they do incorporate it but it, it's not like every person they interview is a psychic so this was a bit of a different type interview when laura came on talking about energy and she communicates with beings and other dimensions like that was the sort of thing she was saying and i had not been familiar with hearing people talk that way <laughs> she sounded very serious like it didn't sound like she was trying to make it up so i wasn't sure if maybe she was delusional or something or i didn't think she was lying and then she mentioned her own podcast at the end of that show, which is called Healing Powers, where she's interviewed many other people that have had these experiences, including some people who are more scientific about it, not just talking about the um, their anecdotal experiences. So I started listening to account after account on her show, where it was like this mosaic was developing of people describing such a similar view of reality that was so foreign to me. And I couldn't understand how they were coming up with such a similar picture. And that led me to then look at other sources and read books and look at the science and that's the journey I've been on ever since, not just confined to consciousness, like I said, but challenging so many other of my beliefs. And your first book, uh, End Up, End Upside Down Thinking, and the only reason I'm referencing it is because uh, it, it has it's so pivotal to all of your books, uh, but you get into the scientific, uh, um, the, the, the p-values, which are the how many standard deviations something uh, is evaluated as being true or not. Um, and you're looking at telekinesis and telepathy and near-death experiences and children coming in with previous lifetime uh, full recognition and, and organ transplants where a re recipient has memories enough to convict a murderer uh, based on uh, having received a heart and, and remembering the, the, the situation where the murder occurred. Uh, so it's just crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. But once you look at the, all the science behind it, you have to come up with a different version of, of, of explaining reality that is not within the Newtonian physics model. Um, I, I think Einstein, when he first started uncovering this stuff, uh, was in disbelief and, and didn't want to see it, uh, that shift in paradigm shift either. He called it his religion to believe uh, in Newtonian physics. But towards the end of his career, he embraced it and thought, okay, well, this it's time for, for a world shift. Yeah, and that's the... Maybe that's the the journey we're all on, that we, we start with a fixed belief system and then we realize there are holes in it and then there's a loosening of the grip. So at what point did you look at our medical model? Because I've been in medicine for basically my whole life. My father was on the board of the Price Pottinger Foundation, which was the, the one of the oldest nutritional foundations in America. And then I got interested after graduating from college uh, in uh, holistic medicine, studied acupuncture and went to China and studied there and herbology. Um, so this has been near and dear to my heart uh, for many, many years, uh, giving people better access to, to um, uh, health modalities that, that raise their vibration and, and truly help them at a, at a profound level. What was the uh, penny drop in that situation where you went from writing about uh, liberty and, and UFOs and the reset and, and thinking and living and all these wonderful topics? What was the thing that inspired you to write about medicine? Medicine was top of mind for me when I started this journey in 2016. I did hear about psychic phenomena on a healing health podcast. So I was interested in that topic, generally speaking, and I have been interested for a while and have done all the modalities, acupuncture, energy healing. So I've been in that mode for a while. And I've always thought th that, yes, the, the medical paradigm needs to shift. But for me, 
it's, I think with everything that's happened in the world in the COVID era, I've been looking at things differently, especially with regard to the germ theory of disease and how we think about the determinants of health and illness. And early in 2020, there were varying opinions on what was happening in the world. Some people were saying we need to be locking down. Um, we need to be restricting behavior in order to save people. And then there were others who had a very different opinion. And they would say, well, it's not so serious. And then they were even questioning the the nature of why we get sick. Is it is it this particle that people claim that goes from person to person? Is that the reason people are getting sick? Or are there other causes that we haven't considered? And I, I was hearing this sort of thing a bunch for a few years, but I was writing about other stuff. Like you said, I was writing about liberty and getting into politics and sociocultural issues and the Great Reset. And the genesis of this book, other than everything I've said so far, I can trace it back to June. And I was in Tennessee, actually, speaking at a conference uh, called Rebels for a Cause, hosted by Courtney Turner. And um, I met Alec Zek there, who I had met through Courtney on a podcast talking about liberty a few months before. But he was giving a talk on the history of virology and how it, how it, what's actually happened to make people believe that a germ causes disease which sounds like a very simple thing and like an obvious fact. And I didn't realize that it had been questioned before and I didn't really know the history of it. And he was talking about just um, stuff I had sort of heard people talk about and he said it in a way that I hadn't heard. And then I participated in his series, which is called The End of COVID. It's still available at theendofcovid.com. It's over a hundred hours of people talking about this sort of thing. But I participated at, uh, talking about government and the Great Reset. I wasn't talking about medicine. But I had access to the whole library of, of stuff. So I started listening to what people were saying. And at first, I was really resistant to what was coming up. It just sounded too radical. I, I couldn't write about this. Like, no, this is not something I can do. And then I looked at it more and more and realized this is not only there's evidence for it, but this is really important. And I don't think people even understand the position. Whether they agree with the position or not is a separate story. But there's a scientific debate here about the nature of contagion what germs are. And I just said, I've got to write about this because this is fundamental. And we we could see how a, a dark or negative force would want to weaponize health to control people. If you had a, if you put on the evil genius hat, health would be one way to try to weaponize um, people's fear. So that's the long story short of, of what made me want to write about this topic. Well, and uh, it does seem that a lot of prescient people have uh, written in the past, quite some time ago, uh, recent history and in a little further back history, uh, that medicine could easily be used to weaponize uh, um, and and keep people living in fear. Um, they asked. Uh, my dad was at the Nuremberg trials. Actually, he uh, he went through the um, the enemy lines. Uh, his father was a uh, big in the newspaper business and. So as soon as it was safe, he was able to go in there and um, uh, they asked Goebbels during the Nuremberg trials, well, how did you control the German people? And he just said it was easy. You scared them. Um, and once people are in fear, they uh, lose more critical thinking and are more willing to believe potentially upside down things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, my personal experience during the beginning of COVID was um, I had patients who were uh, ER nurses and if somebody came in with a gunshot wound and blood out uh, and they were COVID positive, that got recorded as a COVID death. Uh, yes. Well, I think a 10 year old can understand that's not good science. That's that's faulty. Um, so if if this is being financially incentivized um, and I talked to many, many hospital workers at that time, you know, people that ran cardiac units. And if somebody was 400 pounds and came in and flatlined of a heart attack uh, and they were COVID positive, that got recorded as a COVID death. So there was a lot of uh, shifting around of cause of death at the time, which um, doesn't seem like good science uh, at, at its face. Uh, so that was my first uh, entree into realizing that this uh, something something's happening here that might not be prudent science. <laughs> yes. And I remember seeing that, too. And it, it, a little red flag went off in my head <clears throat> because I had seen issues with science in the realm of consciousness where... If you had an idea that went against the mainstream, it was being suppressed. So I had seen the playbook before and I saw it with COVID. I saw there were hints of that. I didn't know the extent of it. And um, also, you mentioned fear. Um, to me, that's a, just a state of consciousness. And I hadn't really put together fully 
the extent to which our consciousness is related to our health. And that's the second half of the book. And to me, it's really the fundamental part of it. I mean, sure, there are environmental toxins and there's radiation, there's EMFs. These are things that are not paid attention to enough and nutrition. But our consciousness, as you know, and our state of mind, that seems central to everything. And if you understand that and really believe it, then that's where to start with health is our mindset. Now you're really in my heart because <laughs> this is exactly what I've been devoted to. Uh, I mean, I love acupuncture and nutritional medicine and all that is just wonderful and helps people so much. Uh, but if you just go into the mind and find out what's pulling the levers in there, uh, um, I have some exciting people coming up on the show, which I'm sure you're familiar with, people like Jill Bolte-Taylor, uh, who had a full stroke of her left hemisphere and was a neuroanatomist and wrote about that experience. And, you know, when the left hemisphere is shut down, you know, the state of, guess what state we're living in? You know, that thinking, categorizing, conceptualizing brain, when it's turned off, we're, we're living in bliss. And we don't have a concept of where our bodies start and the rest of the world starts. Um, the problem is, is that you can't function very well in 3D reality. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> you can't look at your calendar. You can't balance a checkbook. You can't have a conversation. So it's, it's kind of empowering to realize that there's different portions of our brain that have different jobs. Um, and when we understand that and are able to uh, dance with it a bit and be curious about it and, and ask better questions, then, then we are in a position to get better answers, I think. Yeah, and in the book, I, I talk about some spontaneous healings. I mean, these, these blow up the paradigm of medicine. So Anita Morjani is a famous example. She had a near-death experience when she was in a terminal state of cancer. She was about to die, and she had a mindset shift in her near-death state. She realized that she was being too hard on herself, and she encountered her deceased father, and she came back, and her cancer disappeared. I mean, that destroys the, the modern medical paradigm. And I talk about some other instances, too, of people shifting their mindset and also the field of German new medicine, which focuses on what's, how does an emotional shock relate to symptoms that people have. This is not what allopathic medicine, the modern mainstream uh, model, does not focus on that. It's those, those areas of consciousness are secondary, and yet we see miraculous healings as a result of a consciousness shift. And it would make sense just from a financial perspective for an industry not to want to focus on this stuff, because if you could point people toward a drug as your only source of health, that makes money. Whereas if people go within and shift their lifestyle, shift their mindset, and then that can shift their nutrition and the way they exercise and other things, that is not as lucrative. And um, and, and you do go into great detail in the, all of this in your book. And again, I don't know anybody that puts a bigger red bow on it and, and makes it just so clear. Uh, uh, you know, there's no fluff in your book at all. And and if you're listening to it on audio, I mean, there's countless times where I have to back it up and listen to it again because you you pack so much information into such a short space and it's all cited. It's, you know, you're not just giving opinion. You're you're saying, well, the top of the line expert in this who discovered this, um, it's all very, very well cited. Um, and, and we talked about Thomas Kuhn's uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. You, you reference it in one of your books. Um, and I studied it when I was at, at UCLA and it was a book that really stuck with me because... Any time in life, uh, in the course of humanity, there's shifts in paradigm, and uh, the, the what, b in the process of that old paradigm dying, uh, you know, people are starting to notice that there's dots outside of that paradigm that can't be explained by that paradigm. And what your books do so beautifully is connect all those dots outside and and present um, a, a likely model that that makes sense with all those dots, that those outliers that don't make sense in the old medical or, or old thought paradigm. So, um, I mean, I'm just over the moon excited about your books, and I, I'm excited for other people to learn about them, and um, I, I love sharing them with people. Um, I've lit up a lot of people's worlds just because they're like, oh my God, this book is so great. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you're my, you asked earlier about the reaction, and I want to talk about that because for me, it's been pretty anticlimactic. I have these huge paradigm shifts. It's such a big deal. I write the book and then it's out. It's sort of out of my hands. It's a phenomenon I didn't realize before I started writing, right? I will never meet or hear from most of the people that read the books. But I've also noticed that a, there is a lot of resistance. So I, certain people are drawn to them and I really appreciate your enthusiasm and thank you for recommending the books to people. But there are other people, even people that are somewhat close in my life who just don't even want to venture into it. So it has been pretty slow. There, it's, it's, there's enthusiasm in pockets, but then other people who just don't want to go there, that's part of it. And it's almost too much, I think. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I come from such an open mindset myself. It's hard to bring myself back to maybe where I was before, but I do appreciate that there are people that want to live their life. And these sorts of ideas are very disruptive to one's life. Um, I totally appreciate that. I guess I've always been fascinated with uh, things that are um, new ways of looking at, at reality that um, have a benefit. Yeah. Um, and, and the benefit to me is giving people power back to themselves. Uh, I, I've never liked the idea of people coming to me as an expert and depending on me for, you know, years and years and years. I'd much rather have them, you know, find a switch in their world that that causes them to not me, need me anymore. Um, I'd, I'd like to make myself unemployed that way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I have talked to people uh, who were entrenched in, in the medical model, and I do have firsthand experience of this, um, and, and, and I truly could not have a conversation, um, even though I was putting the information that was well-documented directly in front of them, um, that it's, it's like the, there's a disconnect there. there. It's like trying to explain you know, what something looks like to somebody who is not willing to take a blindfold off, and it seems like there's a very strong connection, and it's just human nature, I think. Um, that uh, nobody wants to see something if their income is dependent on them not seeing something. Yes, that's right. And <laughs> and I, I go, going back to Byron Katie's work, because I, I started off in, in, let's say I wrote the first book in 2017. It was published in 2018. And I was so enthusiastic about getting the ideas about consciousness in front of people. And then I was frustrated if people didn't want to engage. And that's carried on through these other topics. But Doing Byron Katie's work has helped me recognize my own blind spots, especially with Beautiful. the way she turns it around, where you have to basically you change the pronouns of the belief and you realize, wait, I'm the one who is doing that thing that I think someone else is doing. And there are so many areas of my own life where I've been blind, where I could not have seen. I look at my old self. I couldn't see at the time, no matter what was presented to me. So I, I've appreciated more that we're all on our own journey and it might not be the right time for someone to read my book. And I can't be frustrated about that. That's so great. Well, I do think there's a lot of untapped areas. I, I know anybody in the in the Joe Dispenza community because everybody's very, very aware of how their uh, consciousness can impact their health in a positive way. And fortunately, there's more and more and more science coming out on that. I, I think not only from, from Joe's camp, but from others. Uh, back at UC Irvine, uh, there was, uh, I think you mentioned Joey Jones in your- My first book, uh, Good Memory. Yeah. Yes. So I met him because I was studying pranic healing at the time, and we were part of that group that, you know, were, were intentionally protecting these HeLa cells from being irradiated, and there was very positive uh, um, scientific uh, results that came out from that. And when you see enough of these things, and again, what I love about your books is you just do such a great job of collecting so many sources of this. It's really hard to to keep the blinders on unless you just aren't comfortable with taking the blinders off. <laughs> yeah. And it also comes from my background where I was accustomed to presenting to boards of directors and senior management teams from a business standpoint, but everything I said had to be backed up. I had to mm -hmm. know exactly where the number came from if I was going to mm -hmm. say it in a meeting because it would be taken very seriously. So I come from that high stakes world and I'm approaching it that way um, where I want everything I say there's a reason I'm saying it and maybe you can disagree with the source that's a separate debate but I want people to know where it's coming from and it seems like things have gotten a little upside down with um, some of the science has become a little bit more like a religion currently uh, and is to be accepted on dogma and uh, uh, debate is is sort of frowned upon in some s situations I think are you finding that to Absolutely. be the case? Absolutely, yeah. And like I said, it's one of the reasons I wanted to write this book because there the debates aren't happening properly enough, in my view, where people will just dismiss an argument and they don't even know what it is that they're debating. They're debating a straw man version that they think is the case, but they don't actually know what people are are arguing. So that's something I've tried to do in all my books is lay out what the positions are so people actually understand. And even then, they don't always want to engage because. I think what happens is, is that when they understand what the argument is, that they start to agree with it and they have to admit that they were wrong. And that can be an ego hit. And I can understand that challenge because I have to deal with it all the time. I have to just constantly realize how wrong I've been and accept that. I think it's kind of fun. I mean, we could just as easily, I, I think school conditions us not, not to ever be wrong, but it's kind of beautiful to see that you've been wrong because then you've got the opportunity to change your life. It's very true. <laughs> so um, a couple of, uh, you know, it's like a sweater and you, you find the right string and you can pull the whole sweater apart. Uh, 
one of the things that you wrote about, again, it's it's material that I'd been across uh, previously in my life and because it's been out there for a while, but you do such a great job of just presenting it so clearly. Um, you talked about um, uh, polio because that's all often hold, held up as the gold standard for for the need for vaccinations. Yes. Um, and I didn't realize the the knowledge of connecting polio to uh, really, really harmful sprays in the environment, such as DDT, um, and I think you said arsenic and lead, yes. uh, was so, so clear. Uh, can you talk about that? Because uh, one of the, you know, when people are accused of being an anti-vaxxer, it's like, well, you, you do know there's no polio because of the vaccine. And that's just another belief that we accept as true and don't seem to have any conversation about. But in your book, you you have a pretty convincing timeline that the use of DDT and and these heavy metals um, was profoundly in the environment alongside of the occurrence of, of polio. Yes. And you point to a more general point where people will believe something because someone else said it was true and they haven't looked into the source themselves. And I'm guilty of this Tur too. With turtles all the way down. And exactly. When you start looking, you <laughs> see it's a, it's, it, there's no basis often in the belief that it comes from something that doesn't have a strong foundation. So with regard to polio, there's some great work done by Jim West, who has aggregated data on pesticide use um, alongside the incidence of polio. And what you can see is that there was a, a strong use of, of pesticides when polio spiked in the mid 1900s that the pesticide use preceded the, the polio symptoms. And these these names that we have for illness, I'm almost hesitant to use them now because I don't really know what they mean. What people have are symptoms. They certainly have symptoms and they die. And we label it as something and it can be correlated with the presence of something on a test, which is indirectly testing some pathogen typically, rather than actually showing the pathogens there, especially with regard to uh, what people call viruses. Um, so. The point with polio, and it's a good case study, is that yes, people have gotten sick. Yes, they've been very sick and they've died, but we often attribute a single cause and we can just say it's this one little thing and don't look at other possibilities. And I quote a number of people in the book saying, look, we should be, we should be examining toxicology alongside what we see with polio symptoms, but we're not doing that. We're spending all of our time focusing on this germ. Um, and that has a profound implication for how we look at the history of all illness whether it's polio or other things, where we think, well, it was this germ. What was happening environmentally in those cases? People were playing with mercury and like thinking that was safe. Um, and, and there's a tendency, it's, it's sloppy scientific thinking often, where we just look at observations and then come up with a cause and realize, wait, in order to come up with a cause for those observations that we see in the world, that's a separate analysis. And we have to look at many different factors. What was going on in the environment? What kind of electricity was going on? Was there a radiation? Psychologically, was there an emotional shock that people were experiencing at the same time? There are just many possibilities, and the mainstream model wants to look at, well, people got sick in the same place around the same time. It must have been a germ. Yeah, the cause, and, and you, you cite two things. One, one that I've said to many of my clients and patients over the years is, you know, you have firemen at a fire. That doesn't mean the firemen caused the fire. Um, and uh, the other one that you used, which I hadn't thought of before, but it's great. You know, you have you have maggots on a dead dead body. That doesn't mean the maggots killed the person. <laughs> exactly. And it's a reasonable hypothesis to say it's one possibility. Oh, maybe the maggots killed the person. But there are other ones to look at, and we know the context, and we know the maggots didn't kill the person. They're they're de they're eating the dead and dying tissue. And the other thing that you did, I thought so beautifully and so clearly in your book, uh, there there are just really flawed, bizarre animal experiments that a lot of these things are based on. And when you, uh, and again, you just do such a great job. You're talking about these monkeys that are being experimented on. And uh, it, it truly, if it was a contagion, you should be able to just put the sick in with the, the well, and then the well would get sick. And that would at least be some indication that the that it is contagion causing the problem, especially since that's what we hear on, you know, the news all the time is that, you know, a person, you know, all you have to do is be in the vicinity of somebody with this thing and you're going to get it. And yet the animal experiments that are done to prove this are, are, are so bizarre. You take, a, a, you know, ounces of, of, of toxic substances and, and inject it into the throat or, you know, and then they have a, a, a long response and it's like, well, of course they did. <laughs> you know, you don't have an isolated virus. You have a soup of, of dead tissue that you're putting in there. 
you know, of course they had a response. And 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 the, that particular monkey experiment, you just describe how every monkey responded. And I mean, it wasn't even a large group of monkeys. Thank God. I mean, what yeah. a cruel thing to put a monkey through anyway. Um, and especially when it when whatever result you got, it wouldn't tell you anything. It's it's just such an irrelevant. And and if that's the study that's being cited as being the foundation for this truth, we got to relook at that. Exactly. <laughs> Don't yeah. We. <laughs> so this is one of those tipping points for me when I was researching, and and I said I've got to write about this. Where I just for something as widespread a belief as contagion, the idea that a sick person has a germ in his or her body and then it becomes transmitted to another person and it makes that other person sick with the same symptoms. That's a, a core belief we have that I never even thought to question. And if that were true, I would think there would be binders and binders of studies for every alleged infectious disease where, like you said, put a sick person in a room with healthy people or animals and all the healthy ones, they should get sick with the same symptoms. Or if it's an airborne thing, take a little bit of the virus that you claim is there, put it in the air, and see if they all get sick with the same symptoms. That's not how these studies are done. And I don't know, maybe I, I can't say that with conclusively, because maybe there's one study where they did it, and I, you know, uh, but there should be many, many of them. And there actually have been some studies where they tried to transmit it. I talk about Spanish flu, where they had people coughing in each other's faces. They were unable to transmit it. But the, most of the studies are on animals. And like you say, they're injecting animals. That's a totally unnatural transmission mode with toxic substances. And then the animals get sick, sometimes not even with the exact symptoms you'd expect. But then the, the experimenters throw up their arms and say, look, there it is. They typically don't run controls, so they don't inject them with a saline or just water. And that's <laughs> such an important part of science. I mean, having studied all the medical stuff that I've studied, you know, you have to have a good control. You have to. And you need the other thing you need is an independent variable, which we could go into that. It's a much more complicated story about the isolation of a virus, having the virus by itself rather than claiming it's within a soup of other cellular material, because you need an independent variable to introduce into the experiment to see what happens in that experimental situation. And without an independent variable, by definition, you can't have a proper control because you don't even know what you're controlling against if you haven't isolated that variable first. So yes, this is a medical discussion, but ultimately it becomes philosophical and about logic. And the logic isn't often there, is that people observe things and it's done sloppily and then they make conclusions and then we're all supposed to believe it. And many people, including doctors, haven't looked at these foundational studies. And I've talked to doctors and they don't, if I ask them what were the foundational studies that show viruses have been isolated, I don't get very good answers for that. They don't know the method. Because the textbooks aren't even talking about that. And I was looking at a lot of the virology textbooks and they were, I found that they were jumping to conclusions too. It's typically, well, we, we know that this virus causes this disease and this is how you treat it. That's how doctors are, are trained, generally speaking. Um, I, there's so many things that come to mind because, again, I've been in the situation where I'm talking to a, a professional and, and putting the science right there. And, and in, in one instance, there was not a profound awareness shift until there was a financial incentive shift and then all of a sudden you know the eyes the blinders were off and and we were now being able to talk about those studies um you referenced uh, peter duesberg in your uh in your book who wrote in inventing the aids virus and uh what happens to doctors that um challenge the 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 dogma the you know uh if 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 this is accepted and and everybody accepts it and somebody says wait a minute there there actually is not a foundation for this this is all built on a house of cards um what happens to that researcher what happens to that doctor yeah the the person's reputation is typically ruined and it's the same thing with consciousness people that want to study psychic phenomena they have to leave academia it, it's this, there's a theme here where there is a narrative that's put forward it's typically very early on. So with HIV AIDS, I, I give the quotation from, I believe it was 1984, where they declared a health official that we've discovered HIV is the probable cause of AIDS. And then the word probable was removed. And those who ask questions, the sci very detailed scientific questions. And if your audience is interested, there's an organization called the Perth Group, P-E-R-T-H. And they've put out many scientific papers, one called HIV, a virus like no other. And it's just, it's highly technical stuff rather than just conspiracy theory. That's my point. But th there's a narrative that gets put forward that this this causes this, and if you question it, you're a heretic and you're actually dangerous. That's what seems to happen, and we saw it with COVID as well. Um, very interesting how the human brain works. Um, I just interviewed the author of No Self, No Problem, and one thing that came out of that that was so enlightening 
was uh, if if uh, if the left brain doesn't know the answer because they studied uh, people that had the right and left hemisphere physically separated. Yes. Uh, and if the left brain, that's our thinking brain, doesn't know the answer to something, guess what it does? Does it make it up something just up? just makes stuff up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it does so believing it. I mean, even though it makes absolutely no logical sense, it will make something up and, and just accept that, that it's truth. So, again, understanding human nature. And I love that you brought up Byron Katie because how beautiful to be able to take our, our, our own angst and our own... Uh, conflict internally and look within and see where that came from and and learn from it. Yeah, the way I phrase it in the book is that presuppositions often go unacknowledged, meaning that the assumptions we have behind our beliefs are not questioned often enough. And I, now I'm trying to catch myself with everything. It's it's much easier for me to do it externally with scientific beliefs, and I'm still working on my own internal beliefs. But I just have to ask myself, how exactly do I know this thing to be true? Why is it that I believe this thing? And I. I want to feel like I know the answer to that. Even if it ends up being wrong, I want to know, well, it's because these people said it and I trust their sources and I think they're smart people. And at least I can rest in understanding why I believe the thing. But I find that many beliefs persist in society where people don't have a reason other than this is the way it is and don't question it. If you were to um, uh, look back in time to 10 years ago, uh, and compare it to where you are today, how would you describe the feeling state then, the the experience of Mark Gober then to today? Wow. So end of 2013, very different Mark Gober, very different. I was so much more focused singularly on professional stuff and working with clients. And I, I didn't have a compass that was directing my life other than the next thing that I was trying to achieve. There was a part of me that was open-minded because I was working with companies that had invented groundbreaking technologies and they had patented those technologies. Sometimes these were big companies that had tens of thousands of patents and other times smaller companies, individual inventors. So I was used to working with people that challenged the paradigm. That's how you get a patent is you come up with something that's novel and non-obvious compared to a person who has ordinary skill in the art. That's the legal terminology at the time. So I was working with rebels in many ways. And I was I was totally down with it. And I would side with the inventors. So maybe there was a part of me that always wanted to challenge things. I just hadn't come across the right avenue yet. And then flash forward to today and the the, the comparison of, of the experience of life then versus now. Well, the first thing that comes up is the desire to control that impulse to want to control everything in my life was much stronger then. It still exists in me because it's super hardwired, but it's uh, I catch it all the time and try to just let go. I know the term people use is surrender. That is the one that I try to embody much more of and the trust of being in the present because I always try to project what's going to happen in the future and I really can't. There are just a million variables. I don't know what's going to happen. And as much as I want to try to project, I can't do it. So I try to walk myself through that exercise and also acknowledge that there are other forces out there that are perhaps pulling the strings that I'm co-creating with. I don't know how it works exactly, but there are forces beyond just I'm a random speck in a meaningless universe. That's where I was before. So I would say I'm in a place now of much more meaning and purpose and wanting to Wanting to be of service, but also wanting to evolve myself. That's the interplay I, I, I'm always trying to balance of like, I'm going to be able to have more of a greater contribution if I'm doing better myself. So this, the inner work that you focus on so much too, Tara, is that's the top priority for me always. And when I write books and do interviews and things like that, to me, that's all just a byproduct of the work that I'm doing on myself. And that wasn't something I thought of 10 years ago in the same way. And how does it feel to be the Mark Gober of today versus the Mark Gober of 10 years ago? It's improved. It's overall improved, like a stock chart. It's It's been- And, a, and what, is, what does improvement mean to you? Definitely less anxiety overall. The way I lived before and the way I looked at life was one that was prone to anxiety by definition. There's no way outside of that. And now it can still come up because I'm very perfectionistic and want to try to control, but I have, I have a different mindset. And it's funny when I talk to friends that I haven't talked to in a while, 
they'll tell me they notice a huge difference. And I don't see, cause I don't see it as much cause it's just, I'm living with myself every day, but to have those reactions of people that have known me for a long time and they, they can tell that things have changed. And what do they tell you? What are the things that they see? I, they think that I'm much more relaxed <laughs> and not as worked up about things. And then also I have a more philosophical outlook. I mean, maybe I always did. I was always just questioning. And I, I think I was always <laughs> questioning and looking at things maybe from an unconventional view, but now it's it's on steroids. I mean, I'm, yeah. everything to me is about, well, how does this relate to our life purpose and much more <laughs> metaphysical? And I look at death and life differently. <laughs> So my when I'm even having conversations, I'm always pulled in that direction, whereas previously I wasn't. So beautiful. Um, if you were to go back and talk to Mark Gober when he was 10 years old, what would you say to him? I would tell him to calm down because at that time I was already starting with competitive tennis and playing tournaments and getting very worked up about winning and losing and then wanting to get good grades. That was starting around then. So I was, I was at that point even worked up about the material achievements. So I would love to have worked with him to have a little more balance. But then again, I wonder if I needed all of that to be where I am today and to be able to write books that appeal to a certain mindset that I know for myself. So maybe I shouldn't say anything to him. Oh, that's <laughs> so great. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, because um, I mean, I know, I know we're both sort of into near-death experiences, and I, I just interviewed Eben Alexander, and uh, he was... Uh, uh, more brain dead than anybody for for about a week and came back to write about it and we just learned so much from those uh, experiences. Uh, I noticed on your Instagram you also had a picture of uh, one of my favorite authors, David Hawkins, and his book uh, Letting Go. One of my favorites. Uh, it's one I recommend to people all the time. I love all of his books, but that's one that I found can appeal to anyone. Yeah, it's very dense. I, I don't know that it draws everybody's attention. Uh, I To me, I think I read it three times. I loved it so much. Yeah, I, I've re read it once and then listened to it on an audiobook a second time. It's profound because not only was he someone who reached high states of consciousness, some would call them enlightened states, but he was a top psychiatrist in New York for years. So he is well-versed in deconstructing the ego and understanding human suffering and where it's unnecessary. So I quote him very often in my books, even in the in the healing book, uh, Upside and End Upside Down Medicine, because he was able to heal himself by shifting his consciousness and looking at his beliefs and unconscious guilt. So I, I do often return to his work because there's hard wiring within myself. I'll, I'll, a situation will come up and I, I thought I was good previously and I'll catch myself and realize, wait, there's something that's unresolved here because these sensations are, of suffering are coming up that probably aren't warranted in this way. So what do I need to look at? And that's another recontextualization for me with regard to health and medicine is that when we have a symptom, whether it's a psychological symptom or a physical symptom, it's a, the body's way of showing us what we need to look at. Whereas the mainstream paradigm wants to say, let's not look at the root cause. Let's just get rid of this symptom. Well, that's not solving maybe what your soul or whatever the universe wants you to look at. So by suppressing it, it's just going to reappear in a different way. Couldn't agree more. That's so true, and um, at least I'm finding it to be true, both with myself and, and the people I work with. Um, and that's just magical when you can get the message. I, I always say, you know, God will come and knock on the door, and if you ignore it, then, you know, the door gets blown down. You, if you ignore that, then the house gets blown down. <laughs> well, that's what happened to me. I would say in 2016, I, I can look back, and I had hints maybe where I should have shifted my life. And, it, and then I suffered a little bit. But then it just, the suffering kept increasing where I, I had no choice. And then things started to emerge into my life that I, I felt like maybe I was more receptive to. So the, the dark night of the soul, as it's called, and I don't know, each person's on a different path. It might be, it might be in some cases avoidable, or maybe it doesn't have to be as extreme if we pick up the signals earlier. Yeah. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you actually described in your book, and I had not been aware of this, that David Hawkins um, went through quite a a healing uh, catharsis of his own where a normal person, well, uh, an, uh, an average person would have gone to the hospital for sure, but he just sweated it out for, um, I don't know how long a period of time it was, but something. So, could you describe that situation? Yes, Do you remember I think it? It, was, it was some kind of a stomach condition. He had a number of these situations where he would, instead of resisting the pain, he would go into the pain. And, and what he would say, this is very profound, that if you're feeling something, it basically means you're not feeling enough of it. You haven't let it go. There's a suppression. And 
the, whether it's an emotion or a physical sensation, we should let it out fully and then it runs out. It runs its course. So he did that with his stomach condition and then he didn't have to go to the hospital after having had to go to the hospital many times. He, in other cases, he's talked about having had surgery without general anesthesia because he was able to let go of the pain that he was experiencing. So it's, this is some real judicu stuff. This is like high level. Um, I mean, I've tried to do it too. I haven't, I haven't been able to succeed in cases where there's pain that comes up or an emotion where you, where you just go into it and let it release. Actually, maybe I've had a few cases where I've gone into it, then I feel maybe a, a brief amount of bliss because you allow it to happen. And then thinking back to just health and disease more broadly, I mean, how many of us are suppressing things where the pain comes up, emotional pain or suffering, and we don't want to look at it, and then it, then it continues to manifest and fester because we're not allowing it to run its course. So true. Wow. Yeah, I, I work with people on this rather frequently. Um, somebody recently came to me and he uh, has a strong military background and, and still actually does have involvement with that. And he was describing all this uh, um, uh, fear that was coming up for him. It was really just just the deepest, scariest stuff. And, and he had also embraced meditation and had done really well with it. And um, I just said, well, instead of fighting it, just go sit sit with it in your meditation and and go as deep as you can into it go go right to the bullseye center of it and just sit there and uh you know text me in a couple of days and let me know what happens and he texted me and he said that was beautiful it totally went away <laughs> right and i've also found that life seems to shift it's hard to put into words but then th different things start happening in one's life when there's a mindset <laughs> shift <laughs> so it is it it's non-linear often where linear would be you hit a billiard ball, then it hits another billiard ball, and you can see the exact chain of events. But when there's a mindset shift, yeah, sometimes maybe the symptom goes away, but then other things in life might start to happen, and it's almost a dimensional shift. And you can maybe tie it back to the original emotional shift or the mindset shift or the change in beliefs, but you can't always see the linearity of how you got there, but it then just starts happening. And another thing that you cited in your book, which is on that same topic, is shared death experiences. Mm -hmm. So um, not not only are we having these shifts in 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 reality and and well in in beingness uh, on our own at, at certain points, uh, especially when we're in a near death experience like Anita Marjani, like you said. Uh, but uh, it, it, there's quite substantial data that we can do this with loved ones as well uh, at the point of death. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Yes. So where a healthy person shares in the dying process of someone who's dying and has an experience that's just like what people call a near-death experience among those who have been resuscitated and talk about what happened. So it's like a, it's a dimensional shift that some a healthy person is able to go through, which is just the implications for that are insane, that there are levels of reality that we are just not perceiving on an ordinary basis. Well, your books do an absolutely beautiful job of opening that door, asking these questions. And again, I don't know anybody that puts a big red bow on it better than you do, Mark. What is the big takeaway uh, that you would like people to get from your work? Thank you for saying that. I, I would say it's all about questioning beliefs. It's really what it is. And, and asking ourselves how we know something to be true. And then really being diligent about coming up with hypotheses rather than people got sick in the same place at the same time, therefore it was a virus. That is illogical. The, the correct thing would be to say people got sick in the same place at the same time, and one hypothesis is a virus, and another hypothesis is an environmental toxin, another hypothesis is a shared emotional trauma, and so forth. That kind of thinking is really critical. And like I said before, applying that thinking not just to beliefs about things in the world, but to our own beliefs about ourselves and other people and our relationships. Beautiful. Um, I, one of the other uh, huge warnings of your book seems to be, and it has certainly borne out in the last few years, is that there's tremendous... Uh, you talk about the stakes involved in not seeing these shifts, um, not seeing or not having the, the open uh, discussion on these things, that uh, when people are turned against each other in fear, um, they're capable of, of just about anything. Yes, and people can be manipulated. So yeah. 
and I, my books have moved more and more in this direction that I, I, do, I think the universe is ultimately benevolent at the highest level, but there is duality, there is dark and light, and the dark can be really dark. It can be at a level where it wants to eradicate love. It wants to eradicate compassion and empathy. And that's a psychopathic mentality, which we know exists psychologically. And you talk to any psychiatrist, that's a real phenomenon. And to me, that's a, a reflection of a metaphysical energy. So if, if people can be manipulated based on health, number one, they can be controlled. If, if we have to offload our health to an authority figure, then we can be controlled. Um, but also we can become weakened if we're not in a healthy state, then we're not going to be our strongest selves to, if we have to push back against dark forces or just be our strongest selves in our family and our, um, in our communities. So health seems to be a very big part of wherever the world is going to go. And my, the book I wrote before it ended upside down medicine and into the upside down reset talks about how society is being openly steered in a very particular direction. And COVID-19 was part of it. It was the, the book that was written by the World Economic Forum members was COVID-19, The Great Reset, where a health issue was going to be used openly to shape society in a direction that certain people think is good. I, I would disagree with them. But uh, the point is that that health can be weaponized. And I quote in the book, Daniel Brinkley, uh, in the medicine book, who has had multiple near-death experiences and he had a life review multiple times. And he was shown decades ago, he claims, that the battle for humanity would be fought in healthcare. So when COVID happened, he said, look, I've been seeing this for a long time that we, our sovereignty is about taking control of our, our bodies and our health and not offloading it. So there is a, there's the, to me, it's the, the individual implications and the collective implication. And that's where you're, you're bringing us now is there, this is society wide stuff of what's the future of humanity and how is health going to be weaponized or not. I'm so glad you said that. And there's a number of uh, authors that you cite in your book, um, Aldous Huxley, um, uh, I, I'm a lot of people, yeah, Rudolf fact, Steiner. The, yeah, Rudolf Steiner. In fact, <laughs> I read the, your, you have a closing quote in your book that I love, love, love. And I read it to my mother last night. Um, I thought it was just a beautiful, beautiful way to close out your book and your discussion on all of this is that, you know, there's the, there are these forces and how does one navigate those forces? And I love, uh, it's a little bit long for me to read yeah. right here right now, but it's it's uh, for anybody getting the book or listening to the book, I highly recommend paying attention to that last uh, long quote you have on on the last page of your book. Um, do you want to mention anything yeah, about that? Yeah, I do. That? Thank you for mentioning it. I, that that was a very meaningful quote for me, I'm, and I'm glad that it stood out to you because it basically synthesizes how I'm looking at life now. How do we navigate a world where there are dark and light forces and we're being steered in different directions? And the, the summary of that quote is, we need to save our own souls first and foremost, like a person being on an airplane, putting on his or her oxygen mask first. We can't be of service until we do that. But in the process of saving ourselves, there are other benefits to society. And we do have a conscience where we want to serve other people. So it is this balance of serving ourselves and then serving others. And the other part of the quote that was really impactful to me is that the, um, the Leviathan, so to speak, this monster of a system that we're a part of, it's not going to be taken down by individuals. It will be taken down on its own devices, by its own weight. C collapsing under its own weight. Collapsing under its own weight. So that's almost a relief to realize that, the, the reality is that's what that's going to happen. And that, that's the attitude that I take. I, I'm not trying to take down the system. I'm trying to awaken myself and hopefully awaken others in the process. And in so doing, we might help to create a better world in another way. But it starts with ourselves. And that is so important because there can be a tendency, and I felt this when I started off, of let's save the world. Um, but we have to save ourselves first. We really do. Well, since you're a Byron Katie fan, um, which I've read her books over and over and over again, I just can't get enough of Byron Katie. <laughs> but she talks about the Diamond Sutra and how it's, uh, you know, because she's married to um, uh, a specialist in 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 the, that area, Stephen, um, I'm Mitchell. sorry, I'm blanking on his last name, Mitchell, yes. Mitchell. Um, but uh, it, it, it says over and over and over again that the most precious thing is to for an in individual to experience enlightenment, that that's bigger than any, all the works of charity in the world, times a 10, times a million, times a you know, 100 million, that just the act of a single in individual awakening is, is more valuable than all of that. So I, I think that echoes what you just said. And I think David Hawkins would agree with that, with his scale of consciousness, which I don't know as much about the details of how he 
constructed it. But he always said that that one person's enlightenment would outdo the negativity of hundreds of people or maybe thousands of people. And it is, um, if I look at my own life, like I said, the, the books seem to be a byproduct of my own evolution. So I evolve and then I open up space maybe for this information to come in. And then I, I use the skills I developed earlier in my life to then write about it. So then it seems like I'm helping other people, but really I helped myself through my own evolution. Then the book just happened later because I became a vessel, a vessel capable of doing it. What a wonderful way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you want people to follow up with you? Um, are you still doing your podcast? I did a podcast series in 2019, which I recommend to anyone who wants to dive in on consciousness and psychic phenomena because I interviewed people like Dr. Eben Alexander and many others. It's called Where Is My Mind? And it's uh, available on Apple Podcast and Spotify and all the major podcast players. Other than that, it's just the books, uh, which are all available on Amazon. They're on Audible. I read them all myself or Kindle or, love that. or um, hard copy. So if any of this interests you, um, I would recommend diving in. And like you said, Tara, the, there's a lot packed in. I don't like the books to be too long in terms of number of pages, but on any one page, there's a lot to unpack. So if you want to dive in, like sometimes thinking about the subject matter for a while after you read it can be helpful to let it sink in. And if you know people and have friends or family members who you think would benefit, I'm, I'm writing these books to try to get it out there to people to hopefully help them. So it, word of mouth is very helpful. I also want to mention something because this is a funny coincidence. Uh, uh, one of your books, I, I do appreciate what you said about the negative forces because your book and End Upside Down Contact and Reset both get into that very deeply, which I think I think it's important to not be too la la <laughs> about everything and realize there there are forces and and how to navigate those intelligently. Um, you mentioned a book called The Control of Candy Jones. Yes, yes. And for people to understand how manipulatable human beings can be and how manipulated the mind can be. I mean, that's you know, I I study hypnosis, so I I, I get it. Uh, you know, and the powers that be understand how to manipulate and. Uh, in her case, she was a woman that was used by the CIA, uh, and it, it only luckily came out in a, in in just pure happenstance that her husband, who realized the woman that he married had a very distinct split personality, and was able to use hypnosis, even though he wasn't a trained hypnotist, he he was a talk show host that knew enough about hypnotism that he um, was able to work through hypnosis to uncover what had happened to her. And he worked with a, a professional in New York that was well known at the time named Herb Spiegel. Is this? Well, Herb Spiegel used to come to my, my parents' property to to enjoy the outdoors in, in Connecticut. So um, I thought that was a funny coincidence and it inspired me to read the book. And what a story. Wow. Right. And it's one out of many. And that yeah. was decades ago. So the, the technology, so to speak, in terms of being able to control people's minds likely has. And most of those stories will never be told because a lot of those people were programmed to commit suicide, apparently. Yes. And they're programmed Tragic. to forget. So this is very sophisticated stuff with the mind, but it's it goes to our earlier points of how important it is to be in control of our minds mm -hmm. and our beliefs and to monitor. And at a time, you would be considered a crazy conspiracy theorist to talk about this, but now it's public information. MK Ultra. It's publicly available information that the U.S. government was working on people's minds and and this comes from Operation Paperclip, which is also openly acknowledged. This was after World War II. There were Nazis who had a lot of knowledge about how to manipulate people's minds using torture, unfortunately, because that's what they were doing. And so those Nazis were hired by governments all over the world, including the U.S. Wow. <laughs> well, that's a sobering, uh, yeah. uh, sobering conclusion to our interview. <laughs> yeah, but the point, the broader point I like that you made is it's important to acknowledge the dark and not be in a state of naivete. That's why I write about it, but also not to be consumed by it. So if, if you have members of your audience who want to dive into this stuff, I can say from experience to do it in a titrated way because it can be really dark and it can bring down the psyche. So there's a balance. Know that it exists, but not get pulled down by it. I am so glad that you said it. Um, but to, quite, to quote scripture, Jesus said, live in the world, but not of it. This I think that's a great way to describe it. Um, yeah, truly, uh, just uh, I got kind of do it with a level of curiosity, and uh, you you just you can't it, it land surrender. That's the only way we can't control. As as uh, and as Byron Katie says, and I quote her all the time with people I'm working with. You know, there's there's your business, there's um, 
there's other people's business and God's business. And if you spend your time devoted to other people's business and God's business, you're going to be very frustrated and very unhappy. <laughs> right. And then who's there to pay attention to your business? Right. Very good. Mark, I'm so delighted to reconnect with you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on Next Level Healing. Uh, folks, it's Mark Gober and an end to upside down living, an end to upside down thinking, liberty, reset, contact, and now an end to upside down medicine. It is available on Amazon and on Audible. And Mark reads it himself, which I love it when the author reads their own stuff because you're getting that whole personal contact and all that all that wisdom that they've soaked up uh, just goes right into their words. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much.